Yeah, so welcome everyone to our uh, Developer Days online presentation. This will be about uh, what's your inventor and uh, Fusion. So I'm Adam Nagy, I'm a developer advocate at Autodesk, and uh, I'm here with my colleagues uh, Brian Ekins and Andrew Akinson, who will also uh, uh, present about uh, product features. So first of all, Every year, there are certain themes around which uh, the new features of the Inventor are organized, you know, what will be coming in the, in the next release. In uh, the oncoming release, it's based around perfect Inventor innovation, bridge to the future. Uh, future. So like uh, some improvements uh, regarding any CAD expansion, uh, concentrating on enhancing the performance, uh, of Inventor, then uh, modernizing the UX, uh, the user interface, and so on. And here are some of the improvements. The presentation material, the PPT actually contains uh, videos for most of the features, which you know explain what this feature do. Uh, usually the videos are not the best uh, <laughs> through go to webinar. So I think the best thing is if I just uh, skip that and go to the actual description of these features later on, you can have a look at these videos yourself. Or actually, um, as I will point it out later, you can also have a look at the beta site if you want even more details on the oncoming features uh, coming inside the inventor. So some sketch enhancements, for example, the preserve projection functionality. So if, you're, if you have your sketch and you project any sort of geometry into the sketch and later on you want to redefine the sketch, so you want to be, you want it to be based on a different plane, for example, then unfortunately now in the next, next release when you're redefining the sketch, all those projections will be kept intact. So you don't have to recreate those. And another thing is auto projection. So when you're inside your sketch and you want to uh, set up a, a constraints between the sketch geometry and the geometry outside it, then uh, it, those geometries outside the sketch will be automatically projected into, the, into your sketch. Some sketch in general usability coming up. Uh, one of the things, you, as you can see on the on the right side, inside the application options, now the given setting look at sketch plane on sketch creation and edit now it will you, it will be a part or assembly specific setting so you can uh, specify it in a different way for these two environments we'll also have a couple of new contextual toolbars these are not providing new functionalities but it just makes it you know much easier for the user to access certain functionalities from inside inventor like sharing a sketch unsharing the sketch toggle sketch visibility or edit your 3d sketch I'm also having a look at questions if there was anything in so far, but nothing. So we can go on. One of the uh, new feature inside extrusions as well. So the new functionality is offset from face. So which means that the, the geometry and the sketch itself doesn't have to be based on the plane of the face from which you want to, uh, to create the extrusion. It can be somewhere else as well. And then you can use this offset from face option so that the extrusion will actually take place from the selected face's surface, which is quite cool. And we have a convert sketch to geometry workflow. So this slide shows how easy it is. So you just simply select the uh, sketch text that you want to convert into geometry. You say convert to geometry. Then you specify the specific font type that you want to use for the conversion. And then you just click OK. And then you will find that it's been translated into geometry. And then you can you use it. Uh, that way later on in your in your workflow in your in your design in case of hole creation there's an enhancement which is the bi-directional hole so this is makes uh, certain uh, modifications in your model much easier if you for example as you can see in the in the picture if you want to create holes on the tubes, uh, both, uh, both sides of the tube, and you only have the middle plane for the tube, then you can take advantage of this new feature in the oncoming release. You have also the spot phase zero value. In the current version, it wasn't supported, but it will be in the uh, oncoming version in 2018. Some sorting functionality inside part lists as and, and bomb so you can numerically or by string sort uh, all the things inside them 
mesh support in drawings. So basically, what it means that uh, now it's a mesh in uh, the next release will be a, you know a first class citizen inside the inventor uh, re in regards to drawing creation as well. So you can do exactly the same functionalities with it, just like with a solid body. So you can create you know section views, detail views, and so on. An enhanced analyze interference. So one of the new options that will be available for you is the treat assembly, uh, treat subassemblies as components. So if you only want to analyze the interference between the assemblies, but not inside the uh, not between the components inside the, the various subassemblies, then you can take advantage of this. Then enhanced analyze uh, interference uh, the parts. So it could be a general or threads related or fasteners from a content center or between uh, you know reference components so this will this information will be provided for you and this is how it would look like in the user interface the four types of uh, uh, information the threaded components are misaligned or thread designation doesn't match or left right hand doesn't match or thread length doesn't match So there will be also improvements concerning AnyCAD for Inventor. So as uh, you may remember, it was introduced uh, in the last release, but now there will be some improvements concerning this. And the R4, which is a mid-year release of 2017, will already be, cap be capable of uh, opening 2018 uh, Inventor files. There are also improvements in uh, as in regards to creating uh, guided tutorials. So you can create and share these tutorials publicly or privately. It's up to you how you want to do it. Anatomy of a tutorial, visual guide, and uh, two tutorials which are available for you. Again, there's a video in this presentation for that as well that you can have a look at and that provides more information about it. You know how uh, the exact details. And we also have a couple of videos proving how the performance has been improved in the oncoming release concerning to fast rotate, zoom with large assemblies and so on. So also in uh, performance improvements when changing the scale, for example, inside of the, of the drawing view. And one big improvement, in my opinion, is for is the measure. Uh, related functionality. So in the previous uh, release or current release, depending on how you're looking at it, the measure command was uh, divided up into multiple parts. Now there will be a single command for that. And it will provide a much better, much more detailed information for the user, as you can see it in the in this property panel in the picture. And also the in canvas view for all this information will be much nicer. So you can see these arrowheads, so it will be much clearer what you're measuring exactly. And also, you don't even have to look inside the property panel, for example, in order to find out the dist that you're measuring the distance and what the distance is between certain points inside the model. So this is just another picture, again, showing how much easier it is to understand the feedback in the user interface coming from the measure command. So this is what I mentioned. So as you can see on the first image on the, on the left, where it's uh, crossed out, the measure command used to uh, include multiple different commands, the distance, angle, loop, and area. In the next release, it will be a single command called measure, which will provide all the functionality. And instead of having this small little user interface for all the information, now we'll have a much more detailed user interface that you can see on the right side of the, of the slide. Here is a comparison between the current uh, user interface and uh, now the in canvas uh, graphics inside the oncoming release of Inventor. As you can see, it's, it's much nicer feedback for the user.
and some other nice features related to these commands. Restart by clicking in empty space, foot architectural as dual unit option, copy, copy all, so you can copy all the information that uh, the measure command gathered from the user interface. Persistence of precision and dual units per document. So now this will be saved inside the document. Whatever you chose when you were using the measure command, whatever unit you chose, when you open up the same document again, then the same units will be used for the measure command. So you don't have to keep setting it. And simplification with improved shrink wrap. So here are the three main reasons why you would use shrink wrap. So share data with partners, but protect your uh, IP, uh, which is the intellectual property. Or provide simpler, smaller models to customers and preserve required connection points, for example. We work with large assemblies to improve performance, including complicated models uh, from other sources. So this is just an overview, again, of these three things, why you would use it. Again, we have a video for that as well that you can look through. A couple of releases before we introduced uh, multi-bodies in, uh, in parts, and it has been added uh, to sheet metal parts as well. Now the new feature is that uh, each you can assign a rule uh, to each uh, body. So they can be following different rules, depending on how you set up things, set things up. Or you can decide to use the same rule or the default rule for any of the bodies by simply clicking the follow defaults uh, checkbox in the dialog. And once you set up the rule, whatever additional feature you put on the specific uh, body, based on that rule will be used on all the features and that has been added to that body. And we have feature support for body raw recognition, so the flange corner, all these features are supporting it. And downstream features follow base solid rule, as I mentioned. And ham, fold, reap, unfold, refold can be only performed on a single body one time. And some UI enhancements as well. So SM style groups, consumed by column, which is sortable, by features filter and select feature capability. Again, a video that you can have a look at later on. In the previous release already, we um, had a shot at creating the model-based definition, but now it is really coming in the next release, which of course is really useful because directly in the 3D model, you will be able to add all the annotation which is necessary uh, for people in order to you know, recreate, to actually make that model. All the information relevant to that model will be available. And also it provides derivative outputs, meaning that the, the the annotations that you're adding inside the 3D model will be available in the uh, 2D drawing as well. So you will be able to extract it from the 3D model into the 2D, 2D drawing. You will also be able to export it to 3D PDF file and that will contain all the same annotations that you added into the 3D model. And one specific type of the step file will also be supporting this. And then also you can use it in downstream apps. So maybe in a CMM path or in an NC tool path or tooling fixture design, that information could be used. So here, the design versus manufacturing dimensions. On the left side, it has shows the implicit promotion of feature dimensions that you added in the 3D model. And on the right side, there's an explicit promotion of feature dimension to general annotation, which is available to you. And annotation management is based on design views. So obviously there could be tons and tons of uh, various annotations that you want to add to your model. And in, a, in order to avoid you know, 
making it look like a jungle, you can just create separate design views inside your model, and in, inside each design view, you can, you can uh, specify uh, uh, different annotations that you want uh, to show to the users in that specific design view. These design views, of course, will be also available, for example, in your 3D PDF export as well, and then along with the various uh, annotations that you created there. So publish to various formats. You can retrieve those dim uh, dimensions from your 3D model into the 2D drawing. You can export it to 3D PDF or to step AP242 as well. And modernized UI workflow. So there's a video about that as well that I'm skipping. So we have a browser search and filter functionality as well. So if you're, I'm quite sure all of you are familiar with the, the browser window inside Inventor. So now that has a search functionality. So as you're typing in the various names of the parts or components, it will be filtered down to only the specific ones that are matching the search criteria based on file name or node name or an I property. And you can also filter in assembly based on unresolved files or out of date files or clear all the filters that you set so far. Also, we'll have a tab based structure which allows users quickly access different browsers. So the model browser or the favorites or the iLogic. Previously, there was a drop down um, combo box uh, which enabled you to choose between these environments. Now you will have all these on separate tabs and you can also drag and drop these uh, into the user interface. So it's much easier to organize them. So here it is the browser docking as well, for example. So all these various tabs that you have, you will be able to just uh, drag and drop them around the user interface and they also provide docking. So you can dock it to the various sides of the user interface or just let them float somewhere in the user interface area. Yeah, so the property panel is the same. Uh, so the property panel is uh, right. So that provides the same sort of function as well. So you will be able to, you know, drag and drop them in the user interface. Inventor connected design workflow. Again, we have a video about it as well. So it was introduced in the previous release already, but there are a couple of enhancements relating to this functionality. So from directly Inventor, you were already able to share your designs with other people, which basically meant that when uh, you say you're inside Inventor and you want to share the design with some other people, you will be able to publish it to A360 and then make it accessible to other people as well. So they will be able to view it or uh, you know add comments to the model, which will be available. Now there will be a couple of improvements. So you will have more access, uh, access to A360 functionality directly inside Inventor. So you don't have to go to A360, for example, to create a new project or create a new version of your file. You will, have, uh, you will be able to do it directly from inside Inventor. So here it is, the versioning design shares. So now you will be able to create a new version of an existing design and share it with a uh, share it with other people in your organization or outside. Also some enhanced comments functionality. So newest commenting tool is now available for design share. Comment on object, comment on points, or create a markup. And as I mentioned it at the beginning, if you want further details on the all the new functionalities, uh, you know, product-wise, what's coming in the new release. And if you want to play with the beta, you can already go to beta.hotels.com. And since you are ADN members, you will have access to this website where you can uh, have access to uh, Inventor beta, even Vault beta as well. You can install those. There are multiple videos concerning the new functionalities uh, coming. So it will provide a much more detailed information on, on the features that I mentioned today. 
And there are also some webcast materials that happened so far. And my last slide, or last slide concerning inventory is uh, API related. So just a couple of changes like shrink wrap, shrink wrap component is replacing derived assembly object. And support for presentation environment. So in the last release, we, we did a huge overhaul of the presentation environment. We completely recreated it pretty much. And unfortunately, at that time, it seemed like we didn't have time to provide the APIs for it. Now there's also, now there, in the next release of Inventor, there will be API support for the presentation environment as well. Also, I mentioned some any CAD improvements or enhancements. There's support for that as well through the API. There is support for the sheet metal rule for each solid body. And then the, if you want to convert uh, a text box into geometry, there's support for that as well in the API. So that's all I have for the inventor side uh, on the desktop, in the desktop area. So does anyone have any question about that? You can, if you have any questions, then in the go to webinar control panel, there's a section which says questions. So you can just type in your question there. That's probably the easiest. And then we'll try to get back to you on those questions. Yeah, there does not seem to be any questions at the moment. So in that case, I, I will just pass on uh, the the presentation part to Andy. So who will talk about, uh, you know, the design automation API that we have, that's part of Forge, and which we are now have some support, well, uh, sort of a private beta concerning uh, uh, Inventor. So I'm just trying to find this thing. Ah, you already became a presenter. Great, thanks. <laughs> Can you see my screen, Adam? Yeah, uh -huh. Okay, great. Thanks, yeah, so as Adam mentioned, I'm Andy Akinson, I'm a software architect on the Inventor team, and Adam wanted me to come share some work that I'm, I'm currently doing on Forge to get Inventor workflows inside of Forge. So that's what this presentation is about. Um, as I go, feel free to type in questions, um, and you know, Adam or Brian can answer them as we go, or they can stop me along the way. All right, so first, just a disclaimer. Um, this is work that is currently underway. We're currently have some things on our roadmap. That doesn't mean that we're actually going to convert this into a product right away. There's no guarantees, um, but I think it's it's still well worth sharing um, what we're doing, the direction we're going, and we are looking for some feedback as well along the way. So as I go uh, along this presentation, just just know that you know this this is work in progress, and this may or may not be actually something that you can build out a product on. With that said. Um, Design Automation API, for those of you not familiar, uh, it is in Forge today supporting AutoCAD. And the idea initially was you could take AutoCAD scripts and run them in the cloud without needing a seat of AutoCAD to do this. So you can have a website set up, you can submit some work to the Design Automation AutoCAD engine. It will go do some work and then based on your input files and the engine will spit out the output files and upload those results into cloud storage. And we'll go through these steps in a little more detail here. So what we've basically done is we've taken the design automation API and we've added an inventor engine to the story here. So if we look at some of the design automation terminology, this will be really important as I go forward. So when I talk about engines, um, in our case, this is really inventor server, or you can consider this as a headless inventor inventor without any UI. And this is where the actual work is done, where the processing is done. Um, on the back end, this is really AutoCAD or Inventor. Um, it gets specified in, in the app package and activity below. So an app package is just a chunk of code or data that the engine runs on. In Inventor's case, this is going to be a plugin or static data that it loads, or it could be dynamic data. Um, and I'll go through the workflow here. It's uploaded via zip file. There's an API to do that in design automation. 
And the activity basically specifies an interface into that app package. So it specifies what will actually get executed. And then a work item comes along and it's the thing that actually does the work. It's the actual job that gets submitted to the engine. And I'll go through that step by step here. So there's basically two phases. There's the setup phase and the run phase. So in the setup phase, we'll go, we'll configure your Inventor plugin, iLogic, any of the static data. You'll create your app package. You'll upload that app package, and then you'll define what can actually be done on that app package. And that's typically done one time in an initial setup, or maybe if you need to update um, your app package or your interface. And then there's the run phase, and this is what's done all the time on, on your web service. So you'll specify the input and outputs. Um, typically, those are files in the cloud. You'll define your work items or the actual jobs that get to be run. You're going to go ahead and submit those to be run, and then you'll get the results back. So I do have some code for this. Um, at AU, I did submit a handout um, to show change parameter. Since this isn't yet um, a public project, I don't yet have this up on public get. So um, at the end, there, I'll show some contact information. You can follow up with me if you want specific examples on this. Um, Adam or Brian, any questions yet on this? There doesn't seem to be any. OK. Great. So <clears throat> the first thing I mentioned in the setup phase is we're going to set up an Inventor plugin. So you can think of a plugin as roughly equivalent to an Inventor add-in without any UI. So it gives you full access to the Inventor API to automate whatever workflow you want to automate in the cloud. Um, the interesting point here is you, you have a top-level object, um, and all the examples I'm showing here is in C Sharp. Um, you could code these in any Inventor API language. Um, so you'll, you get handed an Inventor server object, and then your entry point into your actual um, uh, plugin is going to be through the run or the run with arguments. And my, my full samples will show actually how to fill those out. Um, when you create your app package, there's a manifest file you'll need to create, which is package contents. And it basically will specify where your add-in is and what the platform is. And then the contents can be um, typically, they're an Inventor plugin. Um, it could also be any other data that that plugin may need. So those contents will actually get unzipped in a place that the worker engine has access to. And then in your web app, you will ask Forge to get a URL to upload your app package. And your web app will then upload that, that app package zip file into our app package repository on Forge. So if we look at a little bit of C Sharp code here, this is basically doing what I said before. It's, you know, it's connecting to um, the Forge endpoint to get our upload URL. It's uploading the object. It's specifying what the app package um, version is and then what the engine version is. Um, and this is following the design automation v2 API. So as we go forward, we're, we're actually looking at simplifying the engine interfaces a little bit in the app package management. Um, that stuff I'll get to at the end. But for now, this is, this is what's up in the public Forge design automation API, just with some inventor um, specifics. So when you define your activity, once you have your app package uploaded, you will specify your engine. You'll specify the app package that's actually going to be run what your input parameters are, what your output parameters are, and any arguments. And that activity then gets uploaded to Forge and gets put in our activities repository. And if we look at the code, it's very similar to the app package. You create a new activity object. You define the properties on that activity. You set up instructions um, and input and output parameters. And you know, like I said before, you can think of this as your interface into the app package, what you actually allow your clients to run. So if I look to actually do set up my input file, um, you know, the, the basic idea of design automation is you have input files up on the cloud. Those input files are accessible by our engine. We'll do that bit of work, and then we'll spit the outputs out. So um, one of the critical things is we need to have access to 
wherever your cloud storage is. We'll support any kind of cloud storage as long as we have access. Typically, that's through a signed URL, um, or you could do that within our Forge DM as well. And so here I have an example of how you actually set up a work item. And this is the actual action that happens on that activity. So we create the work item object. We specify what the arguments are, what the activity ID is. Um, and then the input arguments are actually where we'll go and specify where the input files are. I also show here passing some specific parameters through. So I have an app package. It's a really simple app package in the sample that just changes some parameters. And you pass those parameters and values in via JSON. And then the output gets stored um, in this output argument name. And so here's the workflow for actually submitting a work item. So you submit your work item to Forge in the Design Automation API. The worker and venture server engine then gets your input file from your cloud storage. It goes over from that work item then also pulls the activity from our activity repository. The activity specifies the app package. And so we'll also pull your app package in from the app package repository. And then we're set up to actually do the work, run the job. And then when we actually run the job, we take your input plus the code in the plugin. That generates the output as well as a report. So you can actually see any status um, that was done during the, the running of that work item, as well as any output that you wanted to specify in the plugin. So if you wanted to put um, any kind of status or debug output that your web app may need, you can put that in the report as well. And then we send those things out to your cloud storage. And here's a, a little sample with pulling for the result. So I go and create a work item. I pull for the result. Once that result comes back as um, not pending or in progress, we go and we get the work item values out and we get the report URL and the actual results. And here in my example, I just download those to my local docs so that I can debug it with my app. So before I go into a little demo here, any questions up to this point? You see any come in, Adam? No, nothing. No. Okay. So one of the things we do have right now is we have a, a running sample. We've been working with a company called Cool Orange, who has they had an existing inventor add-in called Thread Modeler, which took the specifications of the inventor thread and actually instead of then having how inventor has its normal threads today with just a bitmap image, they actually go and model that thread. So what I'll, I'll just show a little video here to show this in action. So we have the, the standard inventor part today. We have our typical threads, thread definitions. And what we do with that is then we'll go up to threadmodeler.com and they're connected to Forge. We'll upload a part, that same part, into the Thread Modeler app. It uploads it to their storage. From there, they'll then take, and they're, they're actually running it through our viewer API in Forge. And they're getting out what would typically then be seen if you ran through the derivative service in Forge. And then you can see here on the right, that's what we actually get by running through the Design Automation API. We actually modeled the threads. So we're going to download that, open that back up in Inventor, and you can see now that we've actually modeled those threads. It's no longer just a bitmap. So this is just showing one workflow um, that you could actually do by automating work in Forge without actually needing in uh, a seat of inventor, or you can do something, you know, fairly interactive in a web app um, and run that through an inventor engine and get some output. Okay, then I just want to go into where we are today and kind of what's next. So right now we are researching where we can go with this, but it is more than a proof of concept. So we do have what we're calling a private beta today. If you're interested, reach out to me, reach out to Adam. Um, we can you know, look into your workflow, see if it makes sense to bring you into our private beta. We're looking at options for a public beta right now. 
um, but it is running inside of Forge today with limited access. We're working with AutoCAD as AutoCAD works on their next version of the API for design automation. We're trying to figure out how that makes sense for both applications to make it simpler to just specify an AutoCAD engine or an Inventor engine and then clean up the API a bit. Um, and then we are also looking for feedback. So, um, you know, I'd really like to know, does this, you know, what workflows are you looking to automate? What workflows could we automate in the cloud? Um, how do we optimize our engine for various workflows? So these, the engines run on workers in the cloud. Have we configured those to optimally process the, the kind of workflows that, that our customers want to automate? So those are all the things we're looking into right now. And then with that, here's a few contacts. So that's me. And then our product manager is Sanjay Ramaswamy. Feel free to reach out to either of us if you have any further questions, if you'd like to some sample code, or if you'd like uh, access to our private beta at this point. And with that, I think that's all I have, Adam. Yeah, cool. Thanks, Andy. Yep. So I still don't see any questions coming in from anyone. So I guess in that case, we can just uh, move on to the fusion part. All right, you see my screen, Adam? Yeah, uh-huh. Okay. Yeah, so, so I'm Brian Eakins. I'm uh, working on the design for the Fusion API and just uh, want to give a, an update from what what's happened with the API from, from about a year ago. And so first, I think for a lot of people, maybe Fusion is new. And uh, so just to give a quick update on, on what I, my definition of what Fusion is. And so here's a big long name for it. So it's design, simulation, and manufacturing cloud-centric desktop app. And let me define each one of those. So design, so it's a, a CAD modeling system. So here's some, some pictures I just grabbed off of the Fu Fusion 360 gallery. So these are models that have been created by Fusion and been uploaded by customers to, to show off what they've done. So that's the design piece. And then simulation. So built into Fusion, there's some uh, finite element analysis. So you can do some simulation to see if your, your parts are going to work. And manufacturing, also built into Fusion. There's uh, interfaces for 3D printing, or what I have shown here is for actual CAM. And so there's uh, you know, three through five act, two and a half through five axis uh, turning supported for CAM. All right. And then I also said there was a, a desktop application. And so what I mean by that, so it's installed onto a local hard drive and it runs locally. And you're using a, just a regular desktop interface. If you're on Windows, you have a Windows interface. On Mac, you have a Mac-like interface and you're not running in a browser. And because it's installed locally, it, it also works when you're offline. And because it's local and you can work offline or, or when you're connected, the speed is independent of the network, the, the modeling part. And I'll talk in a second about uh, maybe when you do become independent, dependent on the network. And then we have uh, two versions of Fusion, one for Windows and one for Mac. And because it is running locally, it has to be compiled for, for one system or the other system. And, right. But it's also cloud-centric. And you, so a few things that make it this. So this, I mean, most things now are installed from the web, but it's installed from the web. And then it's automatically updated from the cloud. So, you know, so with Inventor, as soon as somebody has a problem, you know, well, which version of Inventor do you have is the first question. And with Fusion, that's not a really a question to ask because everybody has the latest version. 
So when you start Fusion, it checks to see if it's up to date. If it's not, it'll automatically pull the latest update. And this is the thing I think that really makes it the most cloud-centric and is that all data is saved on A360. So when I save a file, that file is automatically uploaded and saved on A360. So on A360, I've got projects that I can organize with folders and, and my files live on the cloud. And so, so that's where I have some dependency on, on the network. So when I save or when I open a file, that has to come down to my local drive to be able to open that. And uh, but so everything's saved on A360. So that, so that's also nice in that you know I can move around from machine to machine and I always have access to my files because they're all saved there. Another thing is is the Forge provides access to to that data on A360, so I have access to my Fusion files uh, through Forge. And then uh, you can also use the cloud for more advanced simulation and rendering. So you can do it locally, but you can also choose to, to do some uh, using the cloud and take advantage of that. All right. So now uh, to the main topic, the Fusion API. And so the API is also a local API. So you're installing Fusion locally. It's running locally and the API runs locally in that that local instance so and we have a, a single API and then that one API is exposed through three different languages so you can choose which language to use C++, Python, or JavaScript and the API supports writing both just kind of simple scripts and more complex apps that have uh, more advanced uh, user interfaces and things like that. So it's the same API for, for everything. Right. So writing uh, simple things or more complicated apps, a lot of times you're, you're automating the things that you would do interactively. And so it's, it's important to be able to, to do through the API the same things that you can do through the user interface. And for example, if I wanted to create a gear Right. I, I can do that interactively through the UI, but I would need to first look up, you know, okay, how, how do I draw an involute uh, curve? And so look up the formula for that, and then using Excel or just my calculator or whatever, calculate some points along that would be along that involute, draw that gear through those points, or that, that curve through the point, mirror it over to get one tooth, and then pattern that around to get all the teeth, and now I, I have a gear. So it was pretty painful, but I was able to do it. You know, now I want a different size gear, so now I go through that whole process again. And so it's a lot easier to be able to automate that. And so I'm, I'm just I'm doing through the same process, but now I have a program that's driving it, and uh, so it, it becomes very simple. And here was an example that came in from a customer. It's kind of interesting. Is So they have some shape. And then they're representing that shape with the, this rough mesh of, of lines. And then they want to build uh, these connectors that, that connect those up. And so the same kind of thing is I could do this manually, but that would be you know, a lot of work, for, especially for a larger mesh. But then if I can automate this process, it makes it a lot easier. Right. So this command equivalent functionality. So here's a little chart to give an idea of, of just where the API is today. So this shows all of the commands in the modeling environment. And uh, the ones that are in green are ones that we have full API support. So through the API, I can, I can create, modify, delete, those kind of things. Uh, the ones in yellow are partial support. And the ones that are in white, there, there's no support. But those tend to be things uh, that you don't automate anyway. So, right. and then these ones that are showing up with the underlines are uh, things that were added uh, in the last year. So, so a big section of that that just came in. So all of these are assembly related. So that's uh, fairly new. We can create all the joints and uh, do interference analysis. 
Uh, here's the, the patch workspace. So again, we have uh, most of the things you can do interactively, you can do through the UIM patch. And here's some things that are new. Uh, here's the CAM workspace. But you notice first of all, uh, so I have render, animation, simulation, and drawing with uh, lines drawn through. So there's there's no API support for for any of those workspaces currently. And then there's some very minimal API support for CAM. So I have a post process, so I can I can post using the API, create setup sheets, and I can force uh, tool pass to, to update. To generate them, so I, I can't uh, create a tool path through the API. I can just update an existing one. So, for example, I could write write a script. So, so first of all, I, I've interactively I've built a part. I've interactively added tool paths to that, and now I could write a script that goes and edits that part, maybe changes some parameters, and then it. Uh, goes to the CAM workspace, updates the tool paths, and then posts that. So I could automate that part of it, but not the actual creation of the tool paths. Uh, the API also has uh, this data panel support. So in Fusion, there's this data panel. And as I said before, Fusion saves all of the files on A360. That's the, the file system for Fusion is A360. And this is kind of the Windows Explorer to A360 for Fusion. So this shows me my different projects, and then I can browse the, the folders and files that I have and open them from here. And the API lets me do that same kind of thing. So from the API, I can get the active project and go look and see what files. And when I save a file, I need to tell it where on A360 to save it. And I could, So there's API for, for all of this stuff. And if you've looked at Forge at all, one of the things, one of the big hurdles on learning and using Forge is the authorization. And with this, you don't deal with any of that because you're already authorized as the Fusion user that's using it. You're running as the Fusion user. So uh, Fusion also uh, has built into it some translators, not not a lot of them, so every, what I have listed here, I just sat step SMT, which is Fusion's uh, kind of version of, uh, of SAT, uh, STL, and OBJ. So those are translators built into Fusion, so they run locally on your machine, and so you can use the API to translate uh, in and out of those formats. And if you need other formats, then you would have to use Forge. And because it supports a, a you know a huge rich set of, of formats, All right, there's some uh, new functionality we've added in the API over the last year that's not in the UI. It's only in the API. And one of these that's pretty important is attributes. And so this is the ability to add information to any entity inside. Fusion, so a, a sketched line, a component, uh, a construction plane, anything you can add information to that and then get to that later. And it can be used in all kinds of ways. Uh, and uh, I've got, uh, I'll show some demos at the end and a couple of those use attributes in, in small ways. So. Uh, there's a, a table command input, so you can create your own commands inside uh, Fusion and and the and the command dialog and this is a new type of input that you can have on the command dialog where you can have tables. So this uh, it's pretty nice for certain commands. And this is another new type of command input to be able to define directions and offsets. And I'll, I'll show you an example that uses this later. Uh, there's a progress dialog. I'll show you an example of that too. Uh, you can query and find out uh, the health status of features. Has the feature failed to compute? You know, is it suppressed? Is it healthy? So you can now query for that information. Uh, we added some utilities to just make working with assemblies easier. Uh, there's the ability to to have uh, so solids and surfaces inside Fusion are rep represented 
is what something called a boundary representation, and they can consist of different types of geometry. So you have cylinders and planes and and spheres and and then freeform things are represented by something called a non-uniform rational B-spline, and but it's possible to convert a B-rep so it's all nerves and some some applications uh, like that. So they just deal with nerves instead of this mix of different kinds of of geometry. And we added some more events. Uh, what's this listening specifically is uh, so you can listen to what commands the user is running. And all right, some future functionality. So I, I put this presentation together. Well, let me go through this first. So, so custom graphics. Uh, so this is the ability to, to have access to the low-level graphics of Fusion. So you can draw graphics that represent what you want, and they'll be shown along with the, the Fusion graphics. Uh, access to the context menu, so you can edit that, add items to it, remove items, and, and so you have complete control over the context menu. Uh, they will have a, a floating dialogue inside Fusion. So Fusion has these today, actually the browser, there's a, a what's new, getting started kind of panel, there's a text uh, menu thing at the bottom of the window. So those are, are what are called palettes and they can float around. They're independent of a command and through the API you'll be able to create these and, and they contain HTML that, so that so their contents can be essentially anything. Uh, be able to create your own custom workspaces with its own browser. Uh, be able to find BREP entities with a, a point or firing array through the model and find out what it hits. I uh, able to have just basically allows you to support multiple threads, so you could uh, have something running in a separate thread, and then this uh, supports the ability for that thread to communicate back to your add-in that's running in the the primary thread. And then what I want to know is, you know, what kind of features do you want and need? And uh, so we just we have a backlog. We keep adding items into that backlog and prioritize it based on you know what we feel like is the most important. And so your feedback really helps a lot with that. And so this presentation I initially put together for uh, November at Autodesk University and the Dev Days associated with that. And we've had uh, I guess just one release, maybe one or two releases updates since then. Probably two, I guess. And uh, so these three are already in now, so they're not future, they, they're existing. And the, the floating palette is, will probably be in the update that's coming in uh, a couple of weeks, uh, unless we find some problems and need to hold it. But So, so we're making good progress and uh, things keep at, getting added to the API. All right. So if you're interested in the API, just uh, so where to get some more information. And so from Fusion, and I'll demonstrate this in a sec, so I'll go through this kind of quick and then go through it a little more in, in a minute. Is uh, So from Fusion, you can get to uh, the documentation. And let's see, I'll, I'll show this in a minute. So. Uh, there's a bunch of sample programs delivered with Fusion and as part of the documentation. Uh, there's a GitHub site that has uh, links to, to several videos with overviews on different areas of Fusion and, and several more samples. And there's the API and scripts forum uh, where you can ask questions and, and look at answers to a lot of previous questions. And there's a blog that Adam and me do that's for Fusion and, and Inventor. All right, so let let me uh, well before I switch out of my PowerPoint, I'll let this finish. So so you notice the the picture at the bottom, so that butter melting, and I'll go we'll look in, in a second and see how that's done. So some samples I want to show is uh, so this gear sample which we talked about earlier but show that running and uh, just a big variety of, of different things. This this one here 
So this is a real picture of a of a finished part I machined, and I'll show you know how, how I did that, and we'll come back to that. So let's uh, go to Fusion, and so first. So from Fusion, and when I go to the Help menu, there's a programming interface. And when I run that, or you know, run that command, it takes me here to the Fusion Help, but it's taking me to the first page of, the, of this programming interface topic in the table of contents. So welcome to the Fusion 360 API. And uh, so the thing where that this is useful is uh, has some links to some other things. So so first, uh, there's a link here that'll take you to a post that explains how to get this same content as, as a CHM file. So you can access this all out offline if you choose. Uh, this is a link to the, the GitHub site I just mentioned ago, a minute ago with the, the videos and, and other samples. Uh, here's a link. Uh, to the a PDF file of the object model. So these are all of the objects in the in the Fusion API and just how they're laid out. Uh, there's a link to the to the forum, the API and scripts forum, and a link to the modern machine blog. And then a little bit about the help. So that there's this welcome to the Fusion. There's this what's new topic that that shows what's new in the latest release. So there's uh, some overview of the of kind of the highlights, and then there's a more detailed list of of all the objects and and functions that were added. Uh, there's this user's manual. So these are kind of overview topics of uh, the various parts of the API. So creating your first script and add-in and basic concepts. Of using the API and how commands work and creating custom commands and so so all these so that's the user's manual then there's a reference manual divided up in objects and enumerators so this is really kind of the heart of the help is this is all of the programming objects so for example if we go look at arc 3d so here's the arc 3d object different methods and properties that it supports and if we go uh, to this method, so here's a detailed explanation of, of this method, the arguments, uh, de the description of each of the input parameters, and uh, you know, kind of how it would be called in, in Python, C++, and JavaScript. Right. So that's the, the reference manual. And then one more section here is a, a bunch of sample programs. And those are most of those are in the three different languages, and can be copy and pasted and and run. Okay, so that's what's online. Also, when you install Fusion, it installs uh, the sample scripts folder and on the add-in side. The sample add-ins. So if you have Fusion, you have these, and you can. Uh, you know, look at these as examples and, and run those. So let's go ahead and uh, run this spur gear. So it, this one's available in C++ and Python. So here it's showing a, a custom command. So, so a command has these different kinds of inputs. So this has a, a bitmap input to be able to show a bitmap on the dialog. It has a drop-down input to get to have the user select from a list. And then it has a value input to get input, you know, values from a user. And so I can change these different things, click OK, and it executes and creates the result. Right. So a couple of other uh, examples. So I'm just going to go through a big variety of things just to give you an idea of, of some things, hopefully just to get your ideas coming. So some ideas of things that, that I've done. And so so that gear was was building sketches and features and, and modeling apart. So this one, uh, cork all holes. 
So this is an add-in, so it's running. It, it automatically started running when Inventor got started, or Fusion got started, and added itself to the UI. So to the user, this is, seems like a Fusion command because it's just here. I access it the way I do any other Fusion command. And, and if you're not aware of this, uh, any Fusion command, uh, next to it has this little plus or X. And so if we do the X, it disappeared. So initially it was like this. It wasn't in the top. And But I can come and as a user, I can pick and choose what commands I want the easiest access to. So if I use this command a lot, I can promote it to be in, in the top of, of this toolbar. So I have easy access to it. But when I run this command as a dialog, really simple command. So it has one input for a selection input. And it's asking me to, to pick uh, any bodies that I want. So let's say these two. And click OK. Now it executes and runs. And so this one is, is creating geometry like the spur gear. So it's, it's doing some modeling. And what it, but it was creating a model for each size cork that was needed. So now I have a component for each size hole that was here. Well, so, and so first it analyzed those, that body to figure out if there are any holes and what size holes. And then it modeled a cork for every size hole and then it inserted it into each hole and added a joint. And so now we've uh, filled all the holes with, uh, with corks. And so not really particularly useful, but just to, to show an idea of what can be done. So. Let's see. Here's uh, an add-in that uh, I wrote quite a while ago that uh, it creates a, a section through a mesh. And so these, these aren't fusion models, these ears. This is a, an STL file that I just found on the web that I thought looked kind of interesting. So an STL of an ear. And Fusion lets you import meshes and displays those. So that's what these are. Is, uh, so they're two mesh bodies that I just imported using standard Fusion commands. And now I can run this command. So this is my version 2 of this Intersect Mesh Body add and It's available on the App Store. Or version 1 is on the App Store. I've still got to do a couple of s small bug fixes, and, and then I'll post version 2. But so version 2, so it asked me to pick uh, one or more bodies and then to pick uh, planes that I want to intersect with and I can do offset planes with this too. So let's say I want, uh, well, let me drag this out so I can say where I want the intersection. So this input, so this, this arrow that I'm dragging, as I drag that, notice that it changes the value in this field. So this is the distance command input that I mentioned earlier. So one of the new things that was added during this previous year. So then just another way to get information from the user. And so here I have something in the dialog and also an interactive thing in the graphics window to get a, a distance. And let's say instead of five, I want to do six intersections. And now I'll go out through there. So that's, yeah, that's good. And I click OK. And so here's the progress dialog that I also mentioned is a new thing this year. And there we go. So let me turn the bodies off. So it, it created new sketches on these planes. And so this is just regular section sketch data. It's actually a bunch of lines connected end to end that represent the, the sections through, through those ear models. So there's doing something that Fusion doesn't really do, although I think the mesh environment's been enhanced, and so it does something similar now, too. But, but so being able to, to use the API to read the mesh information, and then the add-in did all the calculations of, of the actual intersection, and then using Fusion the API again to create those, those sketches and, and draw draw the geometry. 
uh, this one is it's kind of so this is that melting butter one and how this works so here's the model and uh, what it does is there's this sketch and this sketch and there's a loft the loft feature that was created between those two and then that loft feature cut itself out of the of a, just a rectangular block that was the block of butter right so as the shape these of the shape of these bottom curves change so if those curves move down and down then that loft moves down and cuts more of the block out and so just by editing parameters So this, this sketch that's closest to us is this melt one. And so if I change uh, this to one inch, so that moved up. Uh, let's see, let's change this to one. So that moved up, this to one. So you can see the, now that, that loft is outside of the block, so it's no longer cutting it. And so what I did, so I built the model, so I had all these parameters, and then I wrote a little script that just would change all those parameters, and then it would take a snapshot of the screen, change the parameters again, take a snapshot, and it just kept changing so that the, those curves move down and down and down through the block so that it ends up uh, carving the block away and melting. And then it also created uh, the puddle, and the puddle it's the same kind of idea. So it has all of these parameters. You can see the dimensions. So, so I first I created a curve through all of these points, and those points are controlled in their x and y position with parameters. So again, this program is changing those parameters and moving those points out and out and out, and that's the puddle that's forming at the bottom. And so by just uh, editing a bunch of parameters, I'm just you know getting a different model, and in this case, capturing a snapshot. And let me uh, let's see where do I have it? I wasn't gonna. Here we go. So here it is again. So it's just parameters. Capture snapshot, change parameters, capture, change, capture, change, capture. And then uh, show an, another little add in. Turn off some of these uh, sketches and turn on a couple of others. So here's an add in that moves the camera around and and this you pick a, an eye curve so the camera the eye is going to be move along this curve and a target so the target will move along the other curve you notice when I ran the command it automatically found an eye in a target and that's because I had already run the command once before and had chosen an eye in a target and then the command is using attributes, so it added attributes to those two curves, two sketch curves, so it could find them later. So that's one example of, of a use of attributes. And uh, so let me go ahead and, and just run this. So it knows that the eye and the target curves, what direction is up, and then how fast I want to move along the curve. And so now I'm not sure how this will play online but as we move along this part, so it's just following, it's positioning the camera, updating it, positioning the camera, updating it, and so we get this animation of, uh, of flying around the part. And the next uh, couple of samples I want to show uh, are related to CAM. 
And I said earlier that Fusion supports a little bit of CAM, you know, not creating anything, but just uh, updating existing tool paths and then outputting. And I want to show kind of how you can uh, maybe extend that to do some things beyond that. So, all right. So here's an example. Let me go back to to here. Is you notice this part? So this is the actual machined part, and I have this this texture that I wanted to create. And I can show you how how I did that. Is so here's the model, and so I, I wrote a script that would take a component. And here's a component that I built manually. And then what the script did is it. Oh, and then I created a sketch. So I, I built that component manually that I just showed you, which was just an arc. The component, all it contained was a, a sketch with, with an arc. And then I created another sketch and just manually drew all of the points that you can see in blue there. Those blue squares are all points, sketch points that I manually placed. And then I wrote a sketch or I wrote a script that had me select this sketch with the points and select a component and uh, and a face. So I would pick uh, this face and then it projected all of those points down onto the face to find where that point intersected, you know, fell onto the face, and then it created a copy of this component at that location. So these are all components that you can see here, but they like, say they're simple components as they just contain a sketch. And so that's that's what I automated was doing that. So those are basically where I want my toolpath to go. But then the next part, unfortunately, because I can't create a toolpath with CAM, then I had to do uh, manually. But uh, I then used uh, this trace option to create a toolpath, and I manually selected each one of these arcs, which was kind of painful. But but so I did that to get uh, this toolpath. And uh, so let me go ahead and and simulate these real quick and see what what I ended up with and I'll let it go fast so so I had I wanted some other texture too so here's a tool path where it has a a big step over so I get that uh, kind of scalloped look and now here it's cutting each of those those arcs essentially. And so that's the result that I end up seeing as you can uh, see here what, on the finished part. And just one more idea with CAM is uh, we did uh, at the Forge conference, we did did a project uh, with Shopbot, and let me create a new file here. And uh, we had some stools, these stools, and we at the Forge conference we wanted people to be able to design basically an engraving to go on the top of their stool, so they could go home with a, a custom stool. But a lot of people hadn't used Fusion. You know, didn't know how to, to do that, so it created some commands. So these are similar to the earlier ones. They let you do designs real quick. And so just some, some simple commands for people to create different designs for their stool top. So here's it's just creating lines and kind of a random mesh. And uh, right, so that's one option. Uh, it's one that creates circles randomly on the top so they could just do different things. So you could also just go in and use Fusion commands to draw a sketch. But these are ways to create things that to make it easier for a non non fusion user. And then whatever sketch that they've created, 
So let's say that and some circles. So they, they create whatever sketch they want and then they use this to cut it. And what this does, so so I have a script or an add-in that reads the uh, these sketches, and it it creates the G code to go straight to the machine. So we bypass CAM completely, and so it's using the sketch geometry really as the toolpath and creating G code, so the the cutter will just follow those curves exactly. And if I uh, click OK here. So ShopBot has this thing called Fabmo, and uh, so this is what we just created, and we can preview that. There we go. So there's our, our curve and lines. I can. So there's our cutter moving along this line. So this is just letting me preview that that G code. So just some, some other options to get creative uh, when doing CAM. So you don't have, have to be restricted to what Fusion lets you do, but you can kind of extend it on either side. Is build some geometry to, to use CAM to build certain kind of tool paths that you want that maybe it doesn't do anyway, or even bypass CAM and, and do it directly. Mm -hmm. right, so that's... Uh, I think everything I have. So if there are any, any questions. And it looks like not. So, all right. Well, thank you everybody for attending. And I hope uh, you learned something <laughs> that was worthwhile. Okay, well, thank you, Brian. Yeah, I'm just still waiting just a couple of seconds if anyone types in a question. Well, okay. Well, it doesn't seem like there's, there will be any questions today. Okay, so thanks everyone for joining this webcast. And uh, exactly as Brian said, said <laughs> hope you learned something today. Okay, bye then.